Good afternoon. Great to be in Lee County and want to thank Superintendent uh, Savage as well as Principal Mason Clark for having us here. Also want to thank uh, all the great folks we have with us. We've got uh, our Education Commissioner Richard Corcoran, our Speaker of the House Chris Sprouls, uh, Senators Pasadomo and Rodriguez, and Representative Zika Roach, Persons Malika Rizzo, uh, GM Bellardo, and Adam Batana. We also have former Ambassador Am Andrew Bremberg uh, here. So I want to thank, and we've got actually some other folks too. We've got students. Uh, we've got the, the debate teams from uh, Calusa Middle School, Three Oaks Middle School, Island Coast High School. Uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, uh, Sebastian Canizaris. Where's he at? Oh, good. We're going to hear from, from him. He's going to deliver some remarks. He's uh, really doing a great job. Um, and we've got uh, uh, some other special guests here. So uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, we want to have, uh, we want to be known as the number one state for civic literacy in the nation. Uh, and today we're going to sign three bills that address key pillars of our civic literacy efforts. It's crucial to ensure that we teach our students how to be responsible citizens. Uh, they need to have a, a good working knowledge of American history, American government, and the principles uh, that underlie our Constitution and Bill of Rights. And these efforts are needed. Uh, a recent survey found that only two in five American adults can correctly name the three branches of government. Uh, more than a third of Americans cannot name any of the rights that are protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And in 2018, a poll found that only 36 percent of Americans could pass a multiple choice version of the citizenship tests that our naturalized uh, citizens have to take before becoming American citizens. And so uh, we've got a lot of work to do. And what I'd like to remind people is, is as we do all these important things, I mean, you know, reading, writing, math, all the different sciences, all this stuff, it's very important. Once students graduate high school, some will go to college, some of them will do other things, and we're big supporters of vocational education and some of the other alternative pathways. Uh, whatever you do, this civics is going to be relevant because you are going to be a citizen. You're going to have to discharge the duties of citizenship, and we want people to be able to do that uh, with a very strong foundation. So today we have three bills. Um, the first bill I'll sign is House Bill 5. It does a number of uh, really important things. One, it uh, has the Department of Education. It tasks them with developing and approving uh, an integrated civics curriculum. Uh, it's very important that students graduate high school with uh, a key knowledge of, of, of certain key principles and facts. And I think that that civics curriculum can really provide a guide to how that should be done. Uh, the bill also expands our previous efforts in civics to add a requirement for the high school government class that um, students receive instruction on the evils of communism and totalitarian ideologies. Uh, we have uh, a number of people in, in Florida, particularly southern Florida, who've escaped uh, totalitarian regimes, who've escaped communist dictatorships um, to be able to come to America. Uh, we want all students to understand the difference. Why would somebody flee uh, across shark-infested waters, say, leaving from Cuba to come to southern Florida? Uh, why would somebody leave a place like Vietnam, why would people leave these countries uh, and risk their life to be able to come here? It's important that students understand that. Now, as part of this bill, Florida will create a portraits and patriotism library so students can learn about real patriots who came to this country after seeing the horrors of these communist regimes. We actually have uh, folks here today. Uh, you'll hear from uh, her in a minute, Anna uh, Abauza. She came to the United States when she was a teenager fleeing from Nicaragua when the Sandinistas brought socialism to that country. She graduated from the University of Florida, met a, met a Venezuelan, and moved to Venezuela. Well, she had a great life there for a time, and then you had another socialist dictatorship take over and destroy her other country. So once again, she risked her life to come back to Florida with her family, making sure the next generation understands what people like Anna have had to go through for the rights and freedoms we enjoy in this country is exactly why that bill was written. I'm also going to be signing Senate Bill 1108. The bill bridges civics education between our high schools and post-secondary institutions by requiring 
state college and state university students to take both a civic literacy course and a civic literacy assessment as a graduation requirement. Currently, students are only required to do one. The bill further requires high school students to take a civic literacy assessment. Um, doesn't have high state consequences, but if you pass the test, you're exempted from the post-secondary test requirement. The bill also expands character development curriculum for high school juniors and seniors and includes instructions on how to vote. Finally, I'm signing House Bill 233. The bill requires colleges and universities to conduct annual assessments on the intellectual freedom and viewpoint diversity uh, at these institutions. It used to be thought that a university campus was a place where you'd be exposed to a lot of different ideas. Unfortunately, now the norm is really, these are more intellectually repressive environments. You have orthodoxies that are promoted uh, and other viewpoints are shunned or even suppressed. We don't want that in Florida. Uh, you need to have a true contest of ideas. Students should not be shielded uh, from, from ideas and we want robust First Amendment speech on our college and university campuses. And I think that having intellectual diversity is something that's very, very important uh, as we go forward. And I know a lot of parents, one of the things they worry about, you know, if you send a kid to a university, you know, are they just gonna basically be indoctrinated? Are they actually gonna be taught to think for themselves, challenge assumptions, and really be critical thinkers and learners? We obviously want our universities to be focused on critical thinking, academic rigor. Uh, we do not want them as basically hotbeds for stale ideology. Uh, that's not worth tax dollars and that's not something that we're gonna be supporting uh, going forward. Uh, so we've, uh, these bills build off a lot of the work we've done since I took office. Uh, when I took office, we uh, signed an executive order eliminating Common Core and establishing a series of objectives uh, for the DOE to deliver high quality standards and instruction in Florida schools, including civics education. And the legislature subsequently approved House Bill 807 in 2019. In 2020, Florida became the first state in the nation to adopt a kindergarten through grade 12 civic literacy book list in its English language arts standards. And two weeks ago, uh, under, uh, at my direction, uh, the State Board of Education took action to stop critical race theory and the 1619 project curriculum uh, from being a part uh, of our school system. Uh, we do not want curriculum that is judging students based on their race, and we do not want uh, false history uh, like you see with the 1619 project. So in less than... Um, and in less than one month, the State Board of Education will adopt new kindergarten through grade 12 civics education standards. So we're excited to be here in Lee County. We have three Lee County schools that are participating in the Florida Speech and Debate Initiative. Uh, recently, Commissioner Corcoran announced that the initiative will expand from 59 schools in 30 districts to 161 schools in 48 districts around the state. I want to thank, I want to take a moment to recognize some of the outstanding members of the Three Oaks Middle School Debate Team who joined us here today. We have Fiona Walsh, uh, Tasia Maines, Isabella Grelick Amori, and then of course Sebastian, who's gonna say a few words for us. I also wa wanna recognize Eric Castro, who took first place in the Lincoln Douglas style debate, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, debate structured from the debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas from 1858 US Senate uh, campaign. And I know that um, uh, people are being able to learn a lot more about civics. We appreciate the passion that a lot of these young people have. You know, I really believe if we show concerted effort uh, to make sure that this curriculum is available to folks, you know, I think you're going to end up producing a lot of people uh, who are going to do great things in our communities. Because you know, at the end of the day, the the ideas that the country was founded on, you know, have been the key ideas uh, for hundreds of years now. Um, in terms of uh, people doing great things and, and people uh, achieving uh, freedoms and, and, and going to new horizons. So I want to thank them for, for their involvement. I want to thank the legislature for their good work on this. Uh, we're going to hear from a few more folks, and then I will uh, sign the bills at that point. So, Speaker Sprouse, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. thank you, Governor, and thank you all for being here today at Three Oaks Middle School. Uh, what a day to be here, to be a Floridian uh, in a school here in Florida in Lee County that's open that's prepared to teach their children 
how to learn and what to learn, how to debate, how to love America. That's what today is all about. I can't thank the governor enough, particularly for that first part, about how these schools are open. A lot of schools throughout the country weren't open to their kids, not to teach civics or math or reading or anything else. But here in Florida, we've made our kids a priority thanks to the leadership of the governor, thanks to the great leadership of Commissioner Corker, who made sure that our schools were open. And today is about civics, and it's about loving America, and what it means to be an American, what our real history is, and what our legacy is by our founding fathers and those who, who fought so bravely to come here and to create something. You know, it was many months ago now, but myself and Representative Zika, who sponsored the Portraits and Patriotism Bill, started talking about how we learned about this country. I know Ardian will share his story about being an immigrant, but I learned about what it means to love America from my dad. I learned about what it was like to serve in the South Pacific in World War II from my grandfather. Commissioner Corcoran learned about what it was like to be in the Women's Air Force in Britain from his mom, who was, who was a British citizen, and his dad, who was in the United States Army, who fought World War II. That's how we learn. I learned about Nor the Normandy invasion from a neighbor down the street who was on Omaha Beach. So we thought to ourselves, you know, no matter how many times you read something in a book, it just doesn't come alive the same way when you're sitting with someone or talking to them. And we saw this great, this great program that was done by the Holocaust Museum where they interviewed thousands and thousands of Holocaust survivors, asked them questions about what it was like to live during that time and to survive a concentration camp, what happened to their families, what kind of food do they eat, all kinds of questions. And, we, and they were able to answer back in this virtual setting and record those for posterity for so long after those folks were gone. And we thought, what if we could do that same thing for people who fled to America, who had all the places in the world to choose to come, but they chose to come here to the United States because where they were from, freedom was a luxury and liberty was just a dream. What if we could interview those people and have young folks like those that are here today ask them questions and hear back about what it really means to live in a communist regime like that in Cuba or to other totalitarian regimes like in Nicaragua or Venezuela. And that's what, that's what today is all about. And myself and Representative Zika and the members that are here today gathered with the victims of communism months ago on the steps of the Capitol to make sure that we would achieve just that. And today, the governor will sign the bill of portraits and patriotism that will allow that curriculum to be developed, to allow those interviews to take place, and more importantly, to allow our students to ask those people questions. But, you know, eventually, those students who hopefully learn about America from those interviews, they will go on to higher education. And as the governor said, we are at great risk as a nation and as a state on the lack of intellectual diversity that is on our university campuses. You know, you hear a lot about things like critical race theory, you hear a lot of things about the 1619 Project. What you don't hear a lot about from our universities is the thing that matters the most, the diversity of thought, the diversity of ideas. We have decided that one ideological standard will, will win the day, but the thing is we're losing because we're not having real conversations. And some people watching will probably think to themselves, well, you know, those are a couple of Republicans talking about what they talk about. The reality is there's a great book called The Coddling of the American Mind. And it's all about an analysis of higher education throughout the United States of America and how since 2013, individuals who are going to their universities have been deprived of what so many of us had the benefit of, and that is to rigorous debates where we could say things, sometimes silly things, so that we could test out ideas to find out what it is we truly believe in. And that's what the intellectual diversity bill that Representative Roach and Representative Rodriguez, who are, or Senator Rodriguez, who are here today, that's what they champion, to make sure that we, as agents of accountability, are making sure that our universities provide these kids, when they get to the universities, the opportunity to thrive and to engage in what is something that is uniquely American, and that is the exchange of ideas. Governor, I'm so grateful to be here, so grateful to be here with these, these great leaders. Great. Okay. Sebastian, I'm going to come up. To put it simply, participating in debate was eye-opening. I realized that convincing someone of something is not only beneficial, but critical to your career. When we have conflicts with other countries, our first step is diplomacy, convincing someone that we are not their enemy. The U.S. has so many allies, not because of our resources, but because of our diplomatic skills. Take for example, politicians. A lot of them have similar views on how this country should run, but again, they have to convince you that they are the best option for reaching those goals. This year, debate has given me not just the opportunity to change opinions, but the opportunity to change the world. Debate is a tool that every child, sh child should have the opportunity to master, and if we could teach this skill to every kid, well, it would be a game changer. Because when you can persuade people to see things through your perspective, then you can get more done by reaching common ground. 
Good job. <laughs> Ambassador Andrew Bremberg. Thank you, Governor. That's, that, that's a tough act to follow. Great job. That was great. Um, I just want to thank uh, you, Governor, uh, Speaker Sprout, Representative Zika, for your leadership and the reason why we at Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation are here today. We are so thrilled with the historic passage of House Bill 5, which is the first education reform bill in any state in the United States that takes on this critical issue of ensuring that young Americans learn about the history of communism and learn and understand in a comparative government setting the benefits of the American political system and the crimes committed by communist regimes and totalitarian regimes around the world. We at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation for almost 30 years have served as a nonpartisan, not education nonprofit dedicated to educating people around the country about the past and present over 100 million victims of communism globally. So once again, we are very excited to be here to mark an important point here in Florida. We look forward to working with your administration on seeing this implemented. We, we of course, have our own resources of our own curricula for you know, teaching about communism and the great witnesses and um, incredible uh, witness project videos we have of many victims of communism, many of whom hopefully will be featured in your own uh, profiles for patriotism here of great dedicated uh, patriots who've immigrated to the United States. And we couldn't be more proud to be with you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you go to some of these college campuses, I mean, they will treat Mao Zedong as like positively. The guy's policies were responsible for tens of millions of people dying. Um, and you see this, you'll see these, uh, you know, like Che Guevara shirts and stuff. You know, this guy was a total communist thug. And yet that's the kind of environment that you see. And so I think us having this. You know, we're really going to be, I think, pushing back against some of the whitewashing that's been done um, by a lot of these people who are, you know, ideological on these college campuses. And so we, we do that and provide the truth. Okay, Anna, where are you? I'm here. Okay, come on. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Yeah. Thank you all. I am very honored to be with you today. Uh, as he said, I, I came here when I was 16 years old from Nicaragua, running away from that um, Leninist Marxist regime. I was president of the school government uh, and they were trying to brainwash us in thinking that they were bringing benefits and well-being to the people of Nicaragua. Obviously not. Right now, that country in Nicaragua, uh, the one that I was born in, um, is even worse than the day that I left. So I'm thankful to be here I would defend this country with my life if I had to. And I tell you that listening to my granddaughter talking to me about socialism not being that bad is the worst thing that can happen to me. So we have to push these bills and we have to show our young people what it really is. And my experience is nothing compared to my friends here who have been real um, victims of torture and um, horrible things. So thank you for being, for having me today. Absolutely. Governor. Thank you. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Governor. I want to start by saying I'm thrilled that the governor has called this bill signing ceremony. I'm going to echo what the speaker said. We're in a school here in the state of Florida that is open. For me, it's a bit of a homecoming because my son, Rhett, attended Three Oaks Middle School. And I can tell you from experience, not only is this school open, but the administrators and the teachers and the staff here are doing great work. And our teachers are giving the students who attend here a great education. So my hat's off to you. As far as the bill goes on intellectual diversity, the bedrock in higher education has traditionally been freedom of speech, viewpoint diversity, and the ability to have academic freedom. Across the country, those bedrocks are crumbling on higher education campuses. With this bill, we will ensure that here in the state of Florida, those bedrock principles remain and our higher education will continue to be an education and not an indoctrination. And I want to thank the governor for signing this bill. It's critically important. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. 
Representative Roach. Thank you, Governor, and welcome again to Lee County. I just want to give a, a shout out to our partners here, uh, starting with the Governor, with Speaker Sprouls, uh, my partner in this effort, Senator Ray Rodriguez, uh, Commissioner Corcoran, and also this, this, the district staff we have here and the teachers and students from Th Three Oaks. Thank you. You folks have made miracles happen over the past year. We appreciate it. And also to our SROs, who you can't see out of the camera angle here to my left, uh, that are here to protect these students and do a great job of that every day. Thank you for your support. Um, getting back to the bill, the governor mentioned in his opening remarks uh, about some surveys he had looked at. When Senator Ray Rodriguez and I started to develop the language for this bill, we looked at a 2017 national survey of student engagement across college campuses across the United States. And what the survey found is that 71% of college students agreed that their institution placed a premium on diversity when that question was asked in terms of race, gender, or religious affiliation. But when that question was expanded to ask about political viewpoint, intellectual freedom, that number dropped from 71% to 50%, which told us that our institutions in large part are placing a premium on people that look different but think the same. And that's not diversity, that's conformity. And I want to thank the governor for signing this bill today and signaling his commitment to keeping Florida's 12 state universities and 28 college systems which serve uh, well over 500,000 students a marketplace of ideas. So thank you, Governor. Great. Thanks. Okay, Representative Zika. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Governor, for um, signing this important uh, piece of legislation that passed uh, both uh, chambers and the legislature unanimously. Uh, America is a big place, uh, a place of big dreams and unique achievements where your place of beginning doesn't determine your place of becoming. I'm an American who began my American journey as an immigrant from Kosovo, and I'm proud to stand here today and tell you that I'm a proud American and a product of America's exceptionalism. When I came to America, I found a place to long for. I found a place to live, but more importantly, I found a place to love and fulfill my God-given potential. America is a unique place. Many, many immigrants from the time this nation was founded have come to our shores hungry for hope and thirsty for a better tomorrow. But because of America, the, that hunger was satisfied and that thirst was quenched. The question in front of us is very simple. Should we tell that story to children, to our children with generations to come? My answer is yes. Under House Bill 5, we have an opportunity to tell our American story to our children in Florida from many who have hailed from countries around the world, have come to America, and have begun a new, new chapter in life and live in the American dream. Only in America this is possible. Only in America under the son of Cuban refugees one day would become the first Cuban-American speaker of the Florida House, Marco Rubio. Only in America, because everything is possible here. Only in America that a son growing up with limited economic means in Hope, Arkansas, that one day would become the governor of Arkansas and the president of the United States of America, President Bill Clinton, only in America. Only in America can the son of Jamaican immigrants stay, the first one, Colin Powell. Only in America can a young refugee coming from Europe, that one day she would become the first woman U.S. Secretary of the State, Madeleine Albright. Only in America can the son of Kenyan immigrant one day would become the first African-American president of the United States of America. Only in America. And that's our story. Story of second chances, story of new beginnings. And I'm proud to stand here today and tell you I'm a proud American and a product of America's exceptionalism. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Rizzo. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will be brief because I cannot say it any better than any of the preceding speakers. Um, but I will speak to the uh, Senate Bill 1108, which I was very proud to sponsor, along with uh, Senator Diaz, who couldn't be here today. Um, this bill, among a lot of other things, mostly is about civic literacy, and we've talked about that. And we know the importance of that. And this bridges the gap between high school to post-secondary education. And this is something that has been critical for us, as you've heard before. I want to thank, first of all, all the members of the House. This bill went through five different voting sessions. And at not one of its stops did it have one single negative vote or no vote. So it passed unanimously 
through all the committee stops, and finally on the full Florida House. Um, all of our House chairs, McLean, Mariano, Drake, Fine, Trumbull, Latvala, and of course all educational staff, oh, and I forgot uh, Chair um, Alupas, Speaker Sprouls, whose commitment to civic literacy has been a bedrock of the entire session. Commissioner Richard Corcoran, and of course his staff, who has been nothing but the best of friends to education here in the state of Florida, and hopefully will continue on uh, for quite some time. Um, someone who's not here today, uh, Dr. Robert Holliday of Tallahassee Community College, who has been uh, the most vocal proponent of this legislation for years, and um, he is extremely happy that this is uh, being signed today. And of course, our governor, who, just like the speaker, has been just a bedrock for civic literacy and being at the forefront of education. Florida is at the forefront of education in the United States, and it, uh, it is going to continue, and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Finally, I want to thank not only all of the teachers out there in, in our school systems, uh, but also all of those civics teachers that for so many years, and my uh, professional life has been dedicated to education, uh, a lot of civics teachers feel that they are um, underrepresented, they feel like they're irrelevant. And for years, I have heard, make us feel relevant, make us feel relevant. Well, today, thanks to this governor, thanks to the leadership of Speaker Sprouls and our Senate partners, they are relevant. Thank you very much. Dr. Savage. Thank you, Governor. On behalf of the School District of Lee County, it is my pleasure to welcome you, Governor DeSantis, Education Commissioner Richard Corcoran, and all of our legislators to Three Oaks Middle School. First off, Governor DeSantis and Commissioner Corcoran, we thank you for your steadfast leadership and continued focus on education, especially during this last year. While many parts of this country kept their buildings closed, our schools opened in August. You recognize that our districts are integral to not only the education of students, but to their health, and the overall health of our community. You made bold decisions to keep Florida open and our residents working while ensuring their health and safety were protected. Doing that gave us the ability to offer our students opportunities that simply would not have happened had they all stayed home, which is why we're here today. I'm excited to be here with our debate teams from Three Oaks Middle School, Calusa Middle School, and Island Coast High School. These students and schools have benefited from grant funding provided by the Marcus Foundation, through the Florida Civics and Debate Initiative. This unique program has created access and opportunities for students through rigorous civics education. The bills you will sign today will put them on track to become engaged citizens, learning how to negotiate different perspectives and engage productively with each other, with the goal of strengthening our constitutional republic for future generations. Our state has put forth the most ambitious set of standards of educational standards in the country, and we in the school district of Lee County accept that challenge. Because we know that there is no better fuel for our local economies than a robust school system, and there is no better engine for democracy than a powerful civics education. We're honored to have you here in Lee County and for your continued support and leadership of this great state. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I don't want to repeat, as uh, has been said, everyone's spoken so eloquently. Um, I do want to just as an overarching theme since the governor took office you know we always ask ourselves what's the purpose of education and so often you hear you know the purpose of education is get a job and it's not what you're hearing today is that what makes america exceptional what makes it great is we're a self-governing society and in order to preserve that self-governing society and this is something that the governor said in naples three years ago when we started the whole civics movement under his leadership, and in order to do that, you have to have a knowledgeable citizenry. You have to raise up critical thinkers. People can work outside the box and, and synthesize large volumes of information, and that's the game changer. Um, I think it was Thomas Jefferson who coined the phrase that if you expect to be ignorant and free, you expect what never was and what never will be. Um, and it's just a fact. You can't have ignorance in a self-governing constitutional republic. The former will destroy the latter. And what you're hearing today are three great bills that preserve that liberty. And, and, and I'll tell you, uh, it's been said, but Governor DeSantis, um, Speaker Sprouls, have led this charge in the last year. Uh, he's been fighting it for, it for three years. And you're seeing the results of it right here. Uh, it was three years ago the governor 
set up a meeting with Bernie Marcus from the Marcus Foundation, the founder of Home Depot. He had a passion for civics. We went to his house and the governor pitched him on this concept of but what, you know, debate changes people's lives. It really does let them see that they can change the world. And he gave us $5 million to start this debate initiative to have civics and debate in every single middle school and high school and you can see how fast we're getting there and this is a perfect example and what you're going to have is not just the civics and debate club you're going to have just thousands of sebastians up and down the state who know and have now realized they can change the world and they can make a difference and it's profound and succeed widely and that's what this is about raising up great citizens to protect the greatest constitutional republic experiment in the history of mankind for another 230 plus years. And so thank you so much, right. Governor, and thank you, Speaker. Thank you. All right, so if you guys want to gather around. Today is the 22nd or 3rd? 22nd. you to hold one of them up because I can't hold all three of them. You can show you hold one of them up. And there we go. Okay. Okay. Who wants, who else wants a pen? Well, so before I became governor, we didn't even have the, uh, the high school requirement. We put that in uh, there. This expands that. So, for example, you obviously, and then the, um, there's going to be developed a, a curriculum through DOE, which is going to have all these important things required. We're expanding it also to do the comparative look between American principles and communist and totalitarian regimes. And so, you know, my view is, it's like, okay, if you're doing this for a semester, right, Let's do it in a way that you know, inspires people. Let's focus on like the handful of really key things that we want every single person to know. Um, yeah, there's some stuff you get mired in the details about, like you know some uh, uh, some piece of legislation in like 18, you know, 90. Yeah, I'm not saying you don't learn that, but I mean these foundational things. Why did the founding fathers? Um, uh, Seek, seek independence. What were the principles that were different between Great Britain and the United States in terms of how they were doing it, or other countries, particularly in Europe? Uh, where did power come from? Who ultimately has power? We believe power comes from our creator to the people, not uh, th to the government. We, the people, create a constitution with the power that's our natural rights. Uh, how did the Bill of Rights come into existence? Uh, what were some of the issues that led to things like the Civil War? What were the stakes in World War II? What about the Cold War? What was all? So there's all these different things. Understanding the Bill of Rights, understanding other key amendments to the Constitution, understanding some differences between federal and state constitutions and how those are done. So there's all these different things um, that I think are fundamental 
we're just we're, we're emphasizing this. We think this is very important, and um, and I think these are going a long way to further. We're also going to have some other announcements uh, over the next couple of weeks. We're going to do even more with respects to the to the civics component, and, and particularly helping not just our civics teachers and providing bonuses if they go through some of the programs that we're asking uh, for for continuing education, but really civics is something that can be important in, in all kinds of different subjects. I mean, English, it could be important. If you're reading literature, particularly if it's about you know, the American experience. So there's a whole bunch of things that I think we want to do. And ultimately, you know, I, these kids will probably all do different pathways in life. But you know, if you're somebody that's working in a skilled trade, somebody that becomes a physician, a banker, who, who knows? All of those people are going to be citizens. They're all going to be part of making sure that, that our country is able to, uh, to preserve the freedoms uh, that, that we possess. So I, I think this is something that's really important. And the legislature, I mean, these bills got pretty, by and large, big support. The intellectual diversity one had some dissent in, in both chambers. But, you know, I think that that's unfortunate. But I think, by and large, we've got a lot of good support for this stuff. Governor, I'd like to ask Mr. Hi. Um, you sent a letter to a local principal telling her that you found probable, probable cause to sanction her for paddling a first grade girl. Um, that could mean she could lose her educator's certificate. What went into your decision? Those are um, pending cases, and so we're really not allowed to talk about pending cases. Um, the Basically, the letter that I sent that outlined what's possible as far as discipline and what were the concerns is all I can talk about at this time. Can you talk a little bit about some of the aggressive action you've taken towards any school official that may have threatened that trust that parents have in the school system in general? Well, and that violation can take place in many ways. I mean, obviously, I think if you look over the last two and a half years under Governor DeSantis's leadership, we've been very, whether it's a violation of uh, indoctrination, um, we've dealt with that very harshly. Obviously, any kind of even um, per a perception that's also based in law of improprieties and touching or whatever, all of those things, we've escalated all of our, our punishments over the last two and a half years to make sure that our classrooms are 100% safe, safe physically, safe emotionally, and safe intellectually. Yeah, and I, and I just the final thing I'll just say with the, the, the debate, I think it's really good that you guys are doing this. Um, what I found is you can tell people that have not gone through that, then they end up in like a university where everyone has the same ideology and they do, and so they're never challenged on anything. They don't really know how to make, make the case because they just assume everyone agrees with them. And particularly in an era that we live in where, um, you know, on social media, corporate media, you know, a lot of these big corporations that have news divisions, you know, they do narratives and they do partisan uh, advocacy, basically. Uh, they're not really wedded to the facts. And I just think it's important to say, okay, we're debating issues. You know, in order to, to debate somebody effectively, you got to have a grasp on the facts. You got to be able to show uh, why your perspective is better. You can't just say your perspective is better because everyone in like a college faculty agrees with you. I mean, who cares? Um, so I think you're learning thinking skills and reasoning ability that is that has kind of become a lost art in many schools across the country and particularly I think on a lot of university campuses and so these students who go through our debate initiative I think by the time they get to the universities if they're in a Florida university we're gonna have diversity of opinions um, some of these other ones you may not have as much uh, but I think you're gonna have a sharper mind and I think you're gonna be in a situation where uh, as things come up um, you're gonna scrutinize people's claims you're not just going to accept uh, kind of what they say on an ideological basis. You'll really want to see whether they're marshalling facts and whether their logic and reasoning is compelling. And, and I think that it's really good. So we uh, had um, a lot of success with this already, and we're glad that we did it, and we're going to continue to do more. So congratulations, guys. All right, we'll see you guys soon.